Sunday morning in the farm country of southwestern Ohio. Cornfields sit empty while the church is filled to overflow. One of the regulars, however, is missing. Ruth Dench lay sprawled on the floor just inside her front door. Dench is half nude with a gardening ax embedded in her forehead. Despite the grievous wound, there is a lack of blood, suggesting the killer used the ax after his victim was already dead. Detectives speculate Ruth Dench was the victim of a random act of violence and begin to track down people with whom she might have had contact. Friends, as well as delivery and repair men in the community, are all questioned and cleared. Then Detective Deaton picks his way through Ruth's personal property and turns up his first solid lead, a receipt book listing the names of people who rented a small home on the back half of Dench's 18-acre property. Found the names and began uh, actually looking for those folks to determine uh, where they lived. Were they still in the area? Were they still in the neighborhood? One of the renters is a local named Donald Korn. Police learn he lived in Dench's guest house for more than a year and decide to pay Korn a visit. He interviewed very well. He had me convinced that uh, he was not a person that would uh, do something of this nature. And, and he had alibis at the time, as I recall. Detectives have their suspicions, but no hard evidence connecting Korn to the murder. The case goes cold and stays that way until a second attack takes place in another small town 130 miles southwest. It's just past dinner in the community of Jeffersonville, Indiana. 54-year-old Dorothy Hendren sits in her Lazy Boy watching Chico and the Man when her head is pulled back and a knife is laid across her throat. And at that moment, he, he cut her throat. And she was begging him, please tell me what you want me to do. I'll do anything, just don't kill me. The attacker ignores Hendren's plea and rapes her. The attacker cuts her again, and Hendren plays dead. The intruder leaves his victim where she lay, rummages through the house for valuables, and departs. Hendren drags herself to the phone and manages a call to 911. By the time police arrive, the victim is on her way to the hospital, fighting for her life. Forensics collects blood and hair samples from throughout the house. Beyond that, there is little else to do. We only had Mrs. Hendren waiting for her, hoping that she would survive to give us more information. Mrs. Hendren does survive and provides a description of the man who attacked her. Police, however, have no name to put to the description. That is, until they get a visit from a woman who fears for her life. Kathy Allen is Dorothy Hendren's next door neighbor. Three days after the assault, Allen calls police to tell them about a man she saw near Hendren's house the night of the attack. I saw him when he pulled up, and then I saw him get out of the El Camino, and I never dreamed that anything like what happened would happen. The man in the El Camino is someone Kathy Allen knows, someone who, a month earlier, lured Allen herself onto his houseboat and attacked her. He knocked me down. He was on top of me, and he was trying to get my clothes off. He did get some of my clothes off, and then um, I started biting and he bit me back, and then I bit his hand, and when he let go, I just remember I got away. I got out, I flew. Allen never told anyone about the attempted rape. Now, however, she provides police with his name, Donald Korn. Donald Korn is arrested and placed into an Indiana jail cell. A search warrant on Korn's houseboat turns up a pair of bloody shoes matching footprints found at the Hendren crime scene. Then Hendren's purse is discovered, ditched in the river alongside Korn's boat. Ron Kemp asks that Korn be brought to his office. Kemp gets Korn a cup of coffee and some food, talks a bit with Korn about his family, and then moves a bit closer to the suspect. Kemp tells Korn he needs to turn the interrogation over to Ohio detectives who want to talk about the murder of Ruth Dench. 
And I said, before I do this, Donald, I need to know something. Did you kill Mrs. Nitch in Ohio? He said, yes, I stabbed her in the heart. Did you attack Mrs. Hendren? Yes, I did that also. And he said, I want to get those things off my chest. Kemp's soft-spoken approach seals the case against Korn in Indiana and provides Ohio with a gift-wrapped confession to Ruth Dench's murder. Or at least it would appear that way. Korn appeals both convictions, claiming he asked for an attorney during the interrogation but was denied one. Police deny Korn ever made the request, and the argument goes nowhere in Indiana. Ohio, however, is a different story. The Court of Appeals looked at the law and said, you know, we don't have an appetite for what we're about to do, but we feel that the law requires us to throw out the confession because he asked for an attorney. And that's what we're required to do. We're required to follow the law. Three years after his trial, Donald Korn's conviction in the Ruth Dench case is overturned. His confession ruled inadmissible. When that was done, it kind of gutted the case. I mean, that was, at that time, the core of the case was his confession. And without that confession, the prosecutor at the time felt that he couldn't prosecute. To, to think that he was going to get off scot-free on this heinous crime that, that he had confessed to and had been convicted on and was sentenced to death to die in the electric chair, I, I was just shattered that, that he had gotten off scot-free. Corn walks in Ohio but still faces a minimum of 20 years in Indiana. A comfort to some, but infinitely troubling to others who can envision the day he might once again walk the streets. All you gotta do is look at this guy and look into his eyes and, and you can tell that he's a killer. And the way he committed both of these crimes in Indiana and in Ohio, uh, I wouldn't want this guy back out on the street. In January of 2000, the name Donald Korn doesn't mean what it used to around Hamilton, Ohio. The memory of Ruth Dench's murder has faded away foremost, save those whose job it is to dig into the old files and not to forget. Frank Smith works the Ruth Dench homicide as if it were fresh, looking for a new angle, anything that might tie Korn to Ruth Dench's murder. Leafing through the old file, Smith happens upon a woman named Louise Ambergi, a woman who is actually Donald Korn's sister. When I knocked on the door and I introduced myself and I explained to her that uh, I was there because of her brother, uh, she told me that uh, it had been a long time coming, that uh, there was something that she needed to tell us. Ambergi has never spoken with police. Now, however, conscience demands she do exactly that. First with Detective Smith, and subsequently in a taped deposition. Ambergi details conversations she and her mother had with Donald Korn during their visits to the state lockup. My mother asked him, Donnie, did you, did you do that? Did you kill Mrs. Dench? And what was Mr. Korn? He said yes. Response? He said yes. All I know is I said, Donnie, how could you do that? And he said, don't worry about it, sis. What's done is done. Ambergi's statement presents Smith with the break he needs, a first-hand account of Korn's confession to murder. With Korn's potential parole date looming, Smith secures a grand jury indictment for the murder of Ruth Dench and prepares for trial. We had to take a swing at it. Whether we failed, whether we were successful or not, wasn't as important as the fact that we had to be committed to try to get a conviction so we could keep him in prison for the rest of his life so the rest of us could be safe. Piper lays out his case. On June 17th, the jury returns with a verdict. Korn is found guilty of aggravated murder. Under Ohio law, the crime is no longer eligible for the death penalty. Instead, Korn is sentenced to life in prison with no chance of parole for 30 years. For Ruth Dench's family, the nightmare finally comes to an end. Our fear was really the, and, uh, a real fear that he would come after us uh, and, and try, to, try to harm us or, or my daughters. And that was a real fear we had over our heads all these years.